Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, we will get started. I'm just going to wait for some a couple of minutes to allow people to join. So I see that uh, people are joining right now. So while we wait for people to join us, maybe I, I'll get us started um, with the introduction. So again, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar um, on dietquality.org, data and tools for 50 plus countries and veil. This webinar is co-hosted by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN, and the Agriculture Nutrition Community of Practice that is known as act to nut my name is Cecilia Gonzalez. I am a co-leader of the Actinut community and I will be your moderator today. First, um, let me share a little bit about the Actinut community for those who are not familiar with it. We are a global network of about 9,000 professionals from 130 countries working on issues pertaining to the intersection of agriculture and nutrition. So from time to time, we have hosted webinar, webinars of interest in this area, but it has been a while since we hosted one. And so we're happy to be here today with so many of you. We are uh, getting close to uh, 200 participants uh, in the first couple of minutes. So we're excited to gather together after so much time. Um, so today, this the uh, webinar is of interest to our community because we are going to be learning about diet quality measurement tools. And these tools can be easily used uh, by people who work in the agriculture sector and also in general multi-topic uh, surveys. So we want to also give uh, thanks to GAIN for co-hosting this webinar with us and for providing the Zoom platform. I'm going to give uh, some instructions first. Uh, so for those who are wondering, this webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing the link later with those who have registered and also through our networks. Um, for those who need to uh, close captions, you can turn closed captions on from your Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you should see the captions option when in the three dots that you see at the bottom in the menu and enable them. Today, we will have uh, a time for question and answer at the end, but throughout the webinar, you can use the Q&A box and we will try to answer your questions as they come. Uh, but we will also have uh, the opportunity for people to ask questions during the Q&A time. We will ask that everyone who uh, is interested to ask a question will uh, raise their hand from the raise hand feature. And uh, the moderator, which is me, I will ask you to unmute and you will be able to speak your question. So before we get started, I would like to, uh, we would like to have a poll to see which region you are joining us from today. So we'll have this poll for a few seconds to until we get a chance for everyone to answer. We'll give it maybe five more seconds. Um, it seems like uh, the majority of people have gotten a chance to answer. So thank you for joining us. I see we have a good number of people joining us from the African continent. Uh, followed by Asia, 
um, then Europe, then North America, and then um, South America. I'm from South America, so happy to see everyone here. Without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce, uh, we're gonna get started. We'll have first a time for our speakers to share. Today's speakers are Andrew Zipa from Gallup, Anna Hereforth from the Harvest uh, Chan School of Public Health, and Gina Kennedy from Gain, and Janneke Hartig from um, Lombard from UNICEF Lab. So Andrew Zipa is going to provide the introduction. Andrew is a partner at Gallup and the co-lead of the Global Diet Quality Project. Many thanks, Cecilia. In September 2016, the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition produced a report called Food Systems and Diets Facing the Challenges of the 21st Century. One of the key findings from this report was that unless policymakers acted decisively to control overweight, obesity, and diet-related diseases, all countries would pay a heavy price in terms of mortality, mental well-being, and economic loss. The report identified that one of the key barriers to proactively policy, to proactive policy engagement was lack of data. This lack of data was urgently needed. Its absence was in inhibiting accountability and action. Upon reading the report, perhaps naively, I called Lawrence Haddad, one of the authors of the report, who brought on board a co-author, Patrick Webb, to see what could be done to address this data deficit and build a global diet quality monitoring system. The results of that call set into motion the work that we see today. They say that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Delivering upon the ambition and mission of this project has only been possible thanks to the expert input of hundreds of stakeholders, ranging from those who helped us with the conceptualization of what a healthy diet means, all the way through to the hundreds of national nutritional experts who've provided and supported the food list adaptation process, which is now completed in over 100 languages and dialects. Today's release of 56 country data sets on the project website, representing approximately two thirds of the world's population, represents a major milestone towards the realization of the ambition of creating a global mechanism for monitoring diets across the world. The data available represents an initial foundation, a starting block towards increasing the visibility and the accountability of our food systems. More data, an additional 30 plus will be uploaded over the next two years. Nonetheless, we recognize that for change to happen, regular, granular, country-owned data is necessary. To that end, we are delighted to report that a number of governments are now due to implement the Global Diet Quality Questionnaire into national surveys, thereby taking us one step closer to the realization of our ambition of a sustainable, global monitor of diets. Once again, I'd like to thank all the collaborators, many of whom are on the line today. We've traveled a huge distance so far and reflecting the future ahead is bright. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my dear colleague, Dr. Anna Herforth, Principal Investigator of the Global Diet Quality Project at Harvard Chan School of Public Health, who will walk you through what is available on the project website. Thank you, Andy, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. We're really excited to share uh, the results of this data collection across 56 countries and also the tools that can be used um, by others to collect data and scale up data collection. Um, the Global Diet Quality Project is a partnership between Gallup, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, where I am in the uh, Department of Global Health and population and uh, GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. And thanks to GAIN again for hosting this webinar today and providing that platform. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also the, the co-lead of the Ag to Newt Community of Practice. And we are really delighted that um, the information here we hope can serve 
to improve agriculture and food systems towards improved diets and the tools can be implemented um, within the agriculture sector or other se sectors um, because they are tools that are really easy to implement and can be implemented um, by, by people in from any background uh, who are doing survey research, therefore sort of democratizing data collection for diets, uh, which has been a key missing piece in the linkages between agriculture and food systems and nutrition. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the, um, the website which we are launching here today. It's at dietquality.org. And you can see here, um, there are several sections of the website which I'd like to introduce to you. So the Global Diet Quality Project, our mission is to enable diet quality monitoring globally and in countries with tools and data. So what the website provides here um, are essentially the tools for collecting diet quality information and the data of what's been collected in nationally representative surveys to date through the Gallup World Poll. We also have a section here, um, which is explore by country where you can find both the tools and the data. And in any, uh, it, you can go to any given country and find uh, these tools and data. And um, I want to point out here that the dark blue countries here on the map are where the nationally representative data has been collected within the Gallup World Poll so far. Those are the 56 countries, which represent approximately 72% of the world's population. And the medium blue is where data collection is currently underway or uh, planned within the next year. So that by 2024, there will be nationally representative data in 93 countries around the world, at least. And um, as Andy said, you know, we, we aim to fill in the countries that are missed and have truly global representation um, and global statistics across all countries on diet quality as a key piece of understanding good nutrition, public health, and uh, the causes of malnutrition in all its forms. Um, I just, I want to emphasize that here, what we're sharing here today is the first time ever that diet data in the general population has been collected comparably using the same tools and indicators in nationally representative samples across countries. And this really fulfills something, you know, not only what Andy was saying in the beginning um, of his remarks around how can we fill this data gap on, on what people eat? Um, it's something that I had been struggling with uh, as you know, a nutrition professional and working on agriculture and food systems and nutrition for many, many years. Um, even when I was a grad student and learning about the multiple causes of malnutrition and uh, finding data on what we know about those causes of malnutrition, including poor infant and young child feeding practices, um, disease risks, and uh, food insecurity. One thing that I could not find as a student was data on what people are eating. And it seemed to me an almost unbelievable gap that I would be studying nutrition, global nutrition, and yet had no data to refer to on diet quality across countries in the general population. So this is the gap that we are beginning to fill with these data. And we can see their um, diet quality here is represented in not just one indicator, but a, a number of indicators. So if we go here to the data page, which is available up here in this menu, or you can equally click view data. What we first see is a list of indicators on diet quality, different aspects of diet quality. And you can always refer back to this page by clicking on data and going to the indicator to read the definition of what these indicators are representing. This is an interactive page 
So you can click on each of the indicators and see the data across countries. So let's start with MDDW, which is the minimum diet diversity for women. This is an indicator that um, has guidance put out by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which is followed in the collection of this indicator. And uh, many countries have, um, have collected this or aimed to collect this indicator in their national plans because it is an indicator that captures um, the likelihood of nu achieving nutrient adequacy among women aged 15 to 49. Um, if they've consumed at least five food groups, they're more likely to have um, nutrient adequate diets. And so we can see here across countries um, the, that there's quite a wide diversity in the percent of women age 15 to 49 who have consumed at least five out of 10 food groups, um, the minimum diet diversity for women. And um, these data can be very useful in advocating for um, you know, food systems and other, other ways to improve uh, diets so that they are more adequate. Um, you can see that you know within this diversity, there's a lot of richness. You could spend a lot of time looking at this. One thing that jumped out to me when I looked at this uh, data across countries for the first time was um, the looking here sort of there's a scale of um, you can see kind of the minimum and maximum of what's found across countries. And here in the minimum we see is coming from Afghanistan. And we know that conditions in Afghanistan are very poor um, for women's rights, equity, and in general, um, a, you know, very poor situation in terms of food access and health and well-being. And we see that reflected kind of heartbreakingly in the data here. Um, and we can also look at the, uh, the food group diversity score, which is the same 10 food groups as are captured by the MDDW, but this is a count of the number of food groups that are consumed. And part of the reason for this indicator is that it can be compared between women and men. So these data collected in countries are of the general population, not only women. Um, this is the first survey um, to do that where we have data across countries. And this is really important because if we care about gender equity and women's diets, we need to understand disparities uh, between women and men. And we can also look uh, between urban and rural and different age groups that's within the data that's been collected. Um, we can also look at this indicator of all five. Uh, actually, again, you can refer to the indicator definitions. All five is an indicator that uh, is the proportion of the population who consumed all five of the food groups that are typically recommended for daily consumption in food-based dietary guidelines around the world. And these include vegetables, fruits, pulses, nuts, or seeds, one animal, at least one animal source food, at least one starchy staple in the previous day or night. These are sort of um, food groups that come up time and again in national food-based dietary guidelines. So if we look at this um, information, we can see actually in most countries, people are, are not, there's the majority of people in the world are missing at least one of or more of those food groups. Uh, we can see, you know, even in the United States where um, there is, you, is the highest income country on this map, 43% uh, only are consuming all five food groups. And, um, you know, the bottom of the scale is, is down to 14%. I think that again appears in Afghanistan. Um, when we looked at the data here, we, uh, you know, could see uh, gender disparities, which were um, one of the largest places was in Yemen, where only a quarter of people are consuming all five food groups, but there was a big difference. Uh, twice as many men as women were consuming all five food groups. It's also interesting to see that, you know, we did not actually see gender disparities in in a lot of countries, um, it didn't show up as much in many countries in Africa. And so the data is, is helpful to show where um, these disparities do or, or don't exist. And um, these indicators I've talked about so far have to do with kind of adequacy of diets. 
um, required food groups and um, nutrient requirements and indicators of those aspects of diet. But adequacy is not the only, uh, the only piece of diet that's important for health. We also care about risk factors for non-communicable disease that come from diets. And here we have an indicator NCD risk, which captures a number of food groups that are associated with risk factors for NCDs, such as diets that are too high in sugar, salt, fat and saturated fat, processed meats. And uh, we can see here, um, you know, there's the, the highest NCD risk factors from diets are showing up in uh, North America, in Central Asia, um, Chile, South, uh, South Africa are having some of the um, highest number of these uh, food groups related to risk. These come, the, the factors that I'm talking about come from the WHO healthy diet recommendations and uh, the recommendations here that include you know, limiting intake of free sugars, keeping salt intake low, et cetera. And so we capture these, these uh, recommendations within the indicator of NCD risk. One of the pieces in that indicator, soft drink consumption, which we can see here, uh, again, showing up very high in, in South Africa, uh, Central Asia, and in the Americas um, in general. We can also look at an indicator of um, zero fruit and vegetable consumption, which also has to do with the you know, lack of protection against NCDs. And we can sort of see patterns showing up uh, in much in West Africa, in South Asia, where um, this is a pretty extreme indicator of having no vegetables or fruit at all. In most countries, we see quite a, no, a high proportion of people are consuming at least some sort of vegetable, you know, at least some sort of tomato or um, green leafy vegetables are, are very common in, in many countries. Um, so this is a, a pretty dire indicator of lack of, of um, fruits and vegetables, which are both health protective and uh, contain um, nutrients for health. And if we want to look at an indicator of these protective factors that protect against NCDs, this is generally an indicator about diversity of um, plant source foods, including whole grains, fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And um, we see quite a, a high diversity of fruits and vegetables showing up in some of the countries in Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, we see actually Mexico shows up as a, a having a fairly high score, and this is largely due to whole grain consumption. So one of the other things that we can see in this data is, you know, I've gone through some of the summary indicators, but you can also see consumption of each of the food groups where data was collected. So we can look at whole grains, and this is the first data set that really has collected data on the consumption of whole grain uh, foods across the world using a, the same standard. This has been a hard indicator to capture in many surveys, and um, yet it's a factor that we know is, uh, is very important uh, for protection against NCDs. And we see um, Mexico and South Asia uh, showing up as quite high consumption of whole grains. And this has to do with whole grains being um, important in the daily staple food consumption. In South Asia, it's atta flour, which is whole wheat flour used to make things like chapatis, which are consumed very frequently. In Mexico, it's corn and, uh, and corn tortillas. Other uh, food groups of interest that can come from the, uh, the food group level data are, for example, processed meats. You know, this is something, even if you were trying to get a proxy of diet data using food balance sheets, uh, you wouldn't be able to, to see this food group. Um, it doesn't show up in food balance sheet data. So we have here an indicator of the percent of people consuming processed meats, um, which are classified as a, a class one carcinogen um, by the, the WHO Institute, uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer. And um, not too surprisingly, we see high levels of processed meat consumption in, in the United States, um, uh, Central Asia, Russia, and uh, Chile, South America. Um, you know, again, you could just have a lot of fun sort of uh, looking around at these different food groups. One of my favorite food groups that um, I uh, studied in my dissertation was dark green leafy vegetables. Um, and, you know, where in the world these are more highly consumed. You know, you can also look at, uh, at something like 
um, milk consumption, where there tends to be a lot of difference in cultural differences here, um, quite high in South Asia, quite high in Kenya, uh, which I, I know well, it's a, a big milk culture. Um, so you can see many of the different food groups here. So that's an overview of the data that are available. And then um, if you are in a position to be di collecting diet data yourself, we have posted here the tools, including the questionnaires that were used in each country to collect this data so that you can use the same questionnaires in your own work and collect comparable data, uh, or uh, you know, these questionnaires, one of the big reasons we provide them is to make it easy for uh, national statistics organizations or other government agencies to be able to collect diet data as well. The diet quality questionnaires uh, take about five minutes to implement, and they can be just, they're just simply read aloud. I'll show you an example from Tanzania. Uh, here we are at the country page. Data has been collected in the Gallup World Poll, which we see represented here on the side. In the resources section, we can click download resources, and we find here the Tanzania Diet Quality Questionnaire in English and Swahili. So if we look at the Swahili one, we see um, the introduction that's been translated into Kiswahili. It basically asks the respondent to think about their day yesterday and everything they consumed throughout the day. And then these are yes or no questions on um, each food group. Um, so these can simply be read aloud exactly as they are. They require no um, follow-up questions, no probing. Um, they contain the food items in each food group, which are the most common, commonly consumed in the country. They're sentinel foods for each food group. And these sentinel foods have been identified through a very um, uh, participatory process with many people engaged from each country. Um, we talked to now it's up to almost 900 people around the world to have identified the right sentinel foods and the right words to be able to um, ask about these foods in each country for now 117 countries. So these are all available, the, the DQQs for download. If you want to just read the English one, it is here. And, um, you know, this is the whole thing. It's just, it, it's, they're all printable on two pages, or they can be copied into other software. And the whole thing takes about five minutes to implement to um, then result in the indicators that, that I uh, went through that we see on the website. I also want to point out that there's companion questionnaires adapted for infants and young children aged 6 to 23 months. Um, this is the IYCF DQQ. It contains uh, basically the same questions as the adult version, maybe with a few items added that are consumed more by infants and young children, like porridges. Um, but it also has additional questions about breastfeeding and um, breast milk substitutes and liquids. And these questions are um, here in order to reflect um, the indicators of assessing infant and young child feeding practices that are published by WHO and UNICEF. So all of the indicators, um, the WHO UNICEF indicators can be calculated from the IYCF DQQs. And um, I also want to note that we have a close collaboration with DHS, the Demographic and Health Surveys, where DHS is uh, and the DQQ questions are aligned. Um, and even for the food items, um, the adaptations for, for the food groups that are being implemented in DHS for the MDDW measurement are um, the adaptations that they we're providing those adaptations from the Global Diet Quality Project. So once you have collected your own data, if you use this tool, you can go again to the tools section and you can, um, you can do one of two things. You can either use the indicator guide um, to create your own uh, analytical code. Um, this guide 
it defines each one of the indicators and it it shows you exactly which DQQ questions are used to add up the uh, the points in the indicator. So you can use that or you can go to the indicator calculator section and there are tools that you can um, upload your data. It's not saved on any server. It's just used for the uh, purpose of calculating the indicators and you can have them um, be automatically calcul calculated. So you can look at, there's a, a template where you can fill out this template with your data in the format um, of the template. And if you have done that, you can select um, here in the CSV upload section, um, you can select the, the file. And I'm just gonna use the example because online you can experiment with this with the example data set. So I've uploaded here the example data set that's available and click calculate indicators. And then you see here the, um, the indicators that are automatically calculated from your data set. You can look at gender disaggregated data and you can also look at urban rural disaggregated data. Um, and you can then click download results and, and save the results um, onto your computer from this function. Um, then there's another option here. If you use R, you can also download an R script to, um, to run on your own machine and generate uh, all of the indicators that are shown on the data page. If you would like to uh, experiment with seeing how the indicators get calculated from the different food groups, you can go down to this section that has radio buttons um, and just think about your own diet um, yesterday and sort of click through on um, which food groups you ate or didn't eat. You can refer to the diet quality questionnaire from your country um, to understand what these food groups contain. And uh, as you click through these, you can sort of see how the indicators are um, being calculated. And if you go through the whole thing, then, then you'll um, uh, have a demonstration of the calculated indicators. So um, one of the uh, other points on the website to be aware of is that there is a section on reports and publications that has the report we released last year measuring what the world eats as long as uh, uh, alongside a brief of that report. It has a lot of information of the details um, and how the data were collected. Also journal publications that uh, have been uh, published so far. There's a lot in the pipeline, but um, you can explore what's here as well as country profiles um, where these are more are coming soon, but you, you can see for a few countries what these look like in terms of digesting the information in a, uh, in a country profile on, uh, and some policy implications of the indicators. So I will now hand it over to Gina who can say a little bit more about um, these conversations that have taken place within countries. Um, Gina Kennedy is the uh, co-lead of the Global Diet Quality Project at GAIN and uh, will summarize a lot of the experience of uh, talking with users and um, building capacity at country level. Thanks, Anna. Um, thanks for that really comprehensive overview as well. So as Anna said, um, I'm going to show you a few additional resources. Firstly, that can be used for training on how to use the diet quality questionnaire and then some optional resources you can use to deepen your understanding of the diet quality questionnaire. And finally, some ideas for uh, where these can be, uh, diet quality data can be collected in countries. So, so far we have learned that the diet quality questionnaires are available for download. They come in English and often in many other languages and that there are companion infant and young child diet quality questionnaire versions. We have also learned that implementation of the diet quality questionnaire module takes about five minutes and does not require any nutrition expertise. That's a really important feature and innovation for many users like myself, and I'm sure many others on, on the webinar today who have struggled to clean and organize dietary intake data after it's been collected 
we hear very often that uh, professionals in other sectors, agriculture, fisheries, they're interested in collecting information on diet, but it's been too complex for them and, and it, it takes too much time and they can't figure it out. So uh, the training is very much simplified uh, using the diet quality questionnaire module. Since enumerators do not need to learn or memorize how to categorize food items into food groups. Really, all of this work has already been done, as Anna explained, in the over 900 interviews uh, to adopt the diet quality questionnaires um, to have sentinel foods representative of individual countries. That means the main focus of enumerator training really is to practice administering the diet quality questionnaire uh, with each other and practice recording uh, answers. So um, in order to get to some training material that's available on the website, you are on the dietquality.org website and you click on the tools button. And Anna has done that for us. You click on tools and here you arrive. And so you see diet quality questionnaire tools and we see the six boxes and each box uh, represents uh, a tool or a resource that you can use. So the one that I'd like to go to is on the far right top box, how to use the diet quality questionnaire training slides. So here, if you click on this, you will find a set of 24 training slides that can be used as part of enumerator training. So it starts off with an overview. It discusses with you the 29 food groups that are part of the diet quality questionnaire. It discusses you know, broadly um, some of the key indicators that uh, can be calculated from collecting this data. And then um, if you keep going, the resources uh, become more practical and it shows you exactly what you need to do to train others to use the diet quality questionnaire and how to uh, record answers and how to, how to practice administering the diet quality questionnaire in pairs. And so as Anna already said, uh, you just, simply read the instructions at the very introduction. Uh, you read them uh, out loud, you practice reading them out loud in your trainings, you practice them in your pilot um, study. And, and then this is simply what the enumerators do. They read these instructions, they read the questions exactly as worded, uh, they read the sentinel food items, and then the respondents simply answer yes or no. So, um, it requires, again, like no, uh, it's very straightforward. There's no embellishment, no probing, um, no, no additional work needed, uh, except for just, you know, the in-class in class practice and pilot testing practice. Okay, now um, I'm just gonna show you a few other tools that I'll mention very quickly. Again, they're set up in this nice, you know, block format. Um, uh, so if you wanted to deepen your understanding of the food groups, you would click on the diet quality questionnaire food group definitions. You can just deepen your understanding if you feel like you uh, would like to know a little bit more. Uh, but of course, the diet quality questionnaire tools already have the sentinel food items uh, listed as per this food group classification of the 29 food groups. Another resource um, are the adaptation methods. Again. This is not mandatory to consult, but it provides additional information on the process that the team went through to develop the uh, country adapted diet quality questionnaires. So just these are for people who really, I'm keen to use the diet quality questionnaire. I wanna deepen my understanding so that I feel confident if I'm delivering a training or explaining to others why I think this is important information to collect. And then finally, um, Anna has already taken us through the indicator guide. Just as a reminder, if you were to click on the data tab, you can be taken in training. If you have the internet during your training, you can be taken directly to that page and then you can kind of interact with it with your group of enumerators uh, to explain to them the indicators and then kind of view some of the global data. So um, you can also download the, the PDF version uh, that Anna has already taken this into if you wanna really as a trainer, look under the hood um, of the indicator calculator. So um, some opportunities that we have been talking with for countries to actually collect diet quality questionnaire data in their, in their own systems 
we were so fortunate to be invited to the Learning Network on Nutrition Surveillance that included 10 countries from East Africa. So some of these ideas come from those conversations, but um, we've been having conversations with many of you uh, about how to start to collect diet quality questionnaire, um, diet quality data. So of course, Anna mentioned that um, the DHS is very interested in collecting more diet quality data. The diet quality questionnaire and the DHS are closely intertwined, and this was an intentional harmonization effort uh, so that the indicators will match up in a very similar way across the infant and young child uh, age and uh, women of reproductive age. But a couple of things are important. We love DHS. DHS is fantastic. However, um, we also would like to have diet quality data monitored you know, on a more uh, regular basis, not just once every five years. That would be ideal. And we also would like to know more about diets of men. Uh, it's very important as a public health uh, risk factor to understand men and women's diets. So some other ideas of where the diet quality questionnaire could be, could be implemented are panel surveys that the World Bank is supporting. These are uh, done in some countries quarterly. Uh, so they go to households on a quarterly basis. It's, a, it's an addition to the Living Standard Measurement Survey or Household Consumption Expenditure Survey. And then finally, um, there's national monitoring information systems. There's the NIPIN platform. And then there's a lot of academics who are just uh, very uh, interested also in using the diet quality questionnaire in their research programs with their students. So before handing over to the next speaker, I would like on behalf of the Global Diet Quality Project to uh, express our heartfelt thanks to our donors. And um, we couldn't have come as far as we have with, without uh, the support, the generous support of our donors. So thank you very much. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Janneke Hardwig Bloomberg. She's Chief of Nutrition at UNICEF Lao Country Office. And she is going to uh, give you a deeper dive onto what it's like to be a user uh, from her perspective as a user of the Diet Quality Questionnaire. The floor is yours, Janneke. Thank you very much, Tina. And thanks to you and the other speakers for this uh, excellent presentation of all this wonderful resource. Indeed, we uh, or I represent uh, one of the countries that has has uh, uh, used this data. Um, uh, Laos is a small country, as you can see here in Asia, surrounded by um, uh, countries that are maybe more <laughs> more known than Laos, such as as, as Thailand, Vietnam, uh, 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 China, and, and others. Um, and uh, we were part of the um, the first first group, as you see us here in in dark blue, um, that that joined the bandwagon and and uh, um, ensured that that we had this wonderful tool uh, utilized in Laos. Also, uh, we joined hands with the DQQ team to uh, support on the adaptation uh, of of these, the standard tool for the context of Laos and, and the translation of it, as well as support the, the data collection. The data collection took part in, in uh, yes, here we see the, the, the deep QQ survey um, uh, in Laos, um, which, which we worked together with also colleagues from other uh, different nations, other development governments. To, to really identify which were the most appropriate food uh, uh, for now, the some foods that are frequently eaten but in small amounts and make more of a garbage. And other foods, for instance, um, for example, the small beans, were now more typically eaten, uh, not as a pulp, but as a sprout. Um, and, and these Adaptations were, were, were made um, uh, prior to the uh, undertaking of, of the data collection. Uh, the data was collected in the uh, uh, third and fourth quarter of 2021 and uh, uh, was collected uh, through uh, uh, 1,000 adults. And since, since then, uh, um, the data was, was analyzed and 
and we have been, been, been using it for a number of things. First of all, um, uh, we undertook also with the support of the DQQ team a, a more detailed report that, that helped us to also reflect on the policy implications uh, um, that uh, there is associated with some of the findings from the DQQ. Um, we have disseminated the, the data, similar to you have seen here, the, the, the two-page uh, briefs uh, from some of the other countries. Uh, we too disseminated this as part of, of the, the uh, Nippin uh, platform in, in Laos and um, have been using it uh, for, for a number of things. First of all, um, it has been really, really helpful in uh, providing us with information um, on the quality of diet, but uh, not just your um, uh, minimum dietary recommendations, but also really to understand, as we heard also from some of the previous speakers, uh, you know, what, what kind of foods are, are, are the foods that are missing in these diets and that we really would want to um, address uh, in, in um, our, our work uh, with government uh, to, to address diets overall. Um, during uh, this time, it has been a very difficult time for, for, for Laos with respect to an economic uh, crisis following the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and we have uh, also been using the, the data, not only in the triangulation, but other sources of data, including uh, also uh, data on food insecurity to better understand the, the, uh, uh, the quality of diets, but also uh, with respect to informing the uh, agenda with respect to the food system. Uh, not just in terms of influencing the policy dialogue that uh, happened uh, um, in 2021, but um, also with respect to um, the uh, development of a action plan, which was actually our full, full uh, pledge to do right now. Um, I can understand that there are some uh, sound issues with my connection, I, I presume. Um, so in case there is any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A box and I'll be more than happy to support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annika. Sorry, everyone, I may have choked up all your names when I pronounced them earlier. but. Um, thank you all uh, to all our speakers. Um, this is really very interesting. We have a highly engaged uh, audience, participants uh, who have a lot of questions. And so we're going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes with um, q and I would ask our speakers to turn on your videos. And so uh, I'm going to start with uh, one of the questions uh, from the Q&A, and then uh, I will explain again how we'll do the questions um, that are going to be asked live. So if you want to ask a question live, please uh, raise your hand, use the uh, hand raise feature. Uh, make sure that you keep your question uh, brief so we can go, um, we can take as many as possible. If you have your hand raised and you're not uh, going to ask your question, lower it. I would be good to lower it now. Um, but I will start. We have this one of our uh, commonly uh, frequently asked questions. So I will ask uh, I will ask Anna to start with this one. The question is, can the DQQ be used across all ages? Is it validated for use with young children and or adults? Thanks for that question. Indeed, that is a frequently asked question. Um, the tool was designed to be used for ages 15 and up. Um, that is primarily, you know, because actually that's that's the age range that's covered in the Gallup World Poll, and it's also the age range that's covered in in DHS uh, 15 to 49 um, for women. 
And so it was sort of a practicality that we the, um, validated the uh, indicators and did the validation studies in that age, age range. Um, of course, there's also the IYCF uh, indicators for age six to 23 months, uh, where those indicators are, uh, are validated for that age range. Um, so in between age two and 14 years of age, there is this general gap in diet quality uh, data collection. There isn't really a um, platform for those age ranges across countries right now. If people are use, are collecting data in those age ranges, um, you know, it's. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions around general dietary assessment in children. Like basically, the question of can children remember and report what they ate yesterday is very difficult um, because. Children may not be able to reliably report, and also caregivers may not be able to reliably report because the children of that age aren't around the caregivers 24 hours a day. Um, so there's the generalized difficulty of collecting diet data in children. Um, so you know we would encourage more research in this area and more validation studies um, beyond the ones that this project has done for older age ranges. Um, you know, in general, uh, the the tools I would could be above age two years of age, um, if you want to be experimenting with using the tools among children, go with the adult tool, not the infant tool, because the infant tool is about breastfeeding and you know other, other issues that don't apply to like school age children or young adolescents. Um, but I think you know there's a lot of possibility there and um, you could experiment with applying the DQQ in those age ranges and would love to see more research in that area. Thank you, Anna. Now we'll move to um, to the hand raised people with their hand raised raised, and I will ask Sulfia Abdura Monova to ask a question. And please, um, yeah, just be brief so we can ask as many as possible. Are you able to unmute? And. Um, if Sufi is not available, I will go to the next person. Oh, there's Sophia. Go ahead. Um, I am rushing. I am not English. Да, вы можете по русски спросить, если нужно. Я просто этот все было по английски. Я столько искала, чтобы был перевод на русский, но К сожалению, не нашла. Это, видать, не было запланировано, что будет на русском. Я бы просила. Мне очень интересны вот эти вот цифры, данные и вот все, что касается вот сейчас питания. Можно ли вот эти все материалы, если они доступны, будут на русском языке, как бы отправить мне на почту? Да, мы, конечно, можем. Я сейчас тоже скажу ваш вопрос для всех. Зофия has asked if the uh, resources as well as um, the webinar are available in Russian um, or other languages. We currently have lots of DQQ country adapted tools translated to Russian and other local languages, but um, I'll leave others to comment on uh, the rest of the tools and perhaps the webinar resources. Thank you. Yeah, any other comments for um, language accessibility? Yeah, sorry, we weren't able to translate the or interpret the webinar in real time. Um, and you know, there might be technological resources available to to interpret it uh, after the recording is posted. Um, but um, as Christina said, you can find the tools themselves translated into Russian and other languages um, for uh, for use. And it's a good point. We'll think about some of the training resources as well if, uh, in the future, those could be translated. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So I'll take another question from the hand raised um, audience. I have Alberta Theorem. Are you able to unmute? And um, if, um, while we wait for Alberta to unmute, uh, well, if that is not possible, I will go to the next one. I have Mfusi Bugatti. Hello. 
I hope you can we hear can me. Hear you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> thank you so much. I think I, I, I would first like to thank the the presentation and this project. I think it's, it's it is very good and, and and extremely useful and amazing. In fact, I I'm, I work in 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 Africa and one of the indicators, the key indicators that you presented, the minimum dietary diversity score for women. It's one of the indicators that we are tracking here here in the continent for the for the Malabo indicators. But then the problem is countries do not report on this indicator and they, 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 they claim there is no data and all this. So I want to know how do you embed these, these interesting findings and studies into the political acceptability of the data such that the nation then reports and, and takes this data as their, their own and report on it officially in the official channels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would like to take this question? I could, could respond to that. So in, in, in Laos, what we have done is we have disseminated the data. Well, first of all, we worked together with government uh, prior to the collection of the data. And then we disseminated the data at a government uh, event, the, our national uh, nutrition forum. And uh, is, we also made sure that the data was available on a government website. So, so basically, we, while it was the initiative of development partners rather than government, then by ensuring that they were closely aligned throughout the process, um, they have really uh, gotten great ownership and, and again has taken it on as, as, as their own. And, and uh, it's, it's now, again, as mentioned, the results are, are, are hosted on government uh, uh, websites and, and are, are being used as one of the resources in country. So I really think that that close engagement is, is really key uh, to, to, to build the ownership and, and then subsequently the use. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just add to that, um, but it's, it's really the same thing that Janneke said. So just to uh, reinforce, is it's really very important to have this level of country engagement. Uh, we are, we've been doing that with some of the GAIN countries, uh, gathering together ministers of agriculture, ministers of health, ministers of education, as well as UN offices and, and others in countries to sort of explain the value of this. But it's really um, heartening to hear you say, Mfusi, that um, the minimum dietary diversity of women is being taken up across the continent of Africa. So um, hopefully this just adds, uh, you know, more fuel to uh, to collection of, of good data on diet quality. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm going to go thank to, you. Uh, thank you so much for your question. I'm going to go to another question from the chat that um, is you know, asked frequently, and I will ask Andy to respond. So can you give us um, just an overview of how the data is collected by Gallup? Absolutely. So the module sits on a broader multi-purpose survey called the Gallup World Poll. So we've been undertaking that annually since uh, 2006. Ultimately, out of the 140 plus countries we serve every year, in high income countries, we're using um, outbound telephone. So random digit dialing, so probability based methodology. And then for all low middle income countries, we're using face to face surveys. So essentially using the most uh, relevant or most available census data, we stratify the country via population, and then randomly select our primary sampling units from those strata. So it's representative of the entirety of the population. Ultimately, we implement those surveys in all major languages within that country, where we train our interviewing teams on all of the different subcomponents of the survey, just in order to ensure that it's as rigorous and robust as can possibly be. And so essentially combining the oversight um, through a centralized function for quality assurance and quality control, while having uh, hyper-local knowledge from our local partners who, who collect the data. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to the questions uh, on with the hand raise uh, feature. So next in my uh, screen is Erdenchimek Uzizuren 
um, Jim Gay is actually a good friend of mine. So, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. I see you're unmuted, but we can't see you yet. In the no. meantime, oh yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm so happy to be here. I, I was just thinking now that exactly a year ago, I was one of the key informants uh, uh, with Chris. I think his name was Chris, uh, to go through the list of the Mongolian dietaries and giving some Mongolian alphabetical name, etc. So I'm so happy that uh, after one year, it's now all produced and publicly available, being a public good for all of us. So uh, I have two questions. One is to Andrew. Uh, I see that Mongolia's data collection is planned next year. Mm, so uh, have you, you said, all the low and middle income countries are face to face. So have you already identified the data collection company to uh, collect the data? And the question to Yannicka, yeah, Yannicka. So I, I couldn't hear clearly all your, what you said all because of a connection, but uh, if uh, I, I understand you work for UNICEF, right? <clears throat> so in Mongolia's case, UNICEF has mixed and UNFPA has DHS, and uh, uh, one of the speakers I think mentioned uh, most uh, like DHS was also a good part of this uh, survey, maybe complementary, etc. So I was wondering if UNICEF used uh, this uh, questionnaire as a supplementary to the mix, or how how did it work uh, in Laos? In Mongolia, we, we have uh, every five year uh, UNFPA. Uh, UNICEF combined mix and DHS, and we we gave a name social indicator sample survey SISS. So and they they have this nutrition part. Uh, so yeah, that's the question. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll address the uh, first part of the question. So we have long-standing collaborators in in all countries. So as mentioned, we've been doing this for almost a decade and a half. And so essentially we view those partnerships as almost a part of kind of our capacity development where annually we're continuing to provide insights and training so we it's yeah, so essentially we've we wouldn't necessarily look at changing a partner unless there's good reason uh, to do so and, and maybe i can come in on the second part of the question with respect to uh whether this is complementary to, to uh, the mix or not. And indeed in Laos, it is, uh, has been complementary. So uh, the last time mix was collect, uh, collected in, in Laos was in, in 2017. Uh, and we uh, undertook this uh, data collection through the Gallup World Poll in 2021. And, and the next round of, of mix is, is happening uh, as we speak. So, so indeed, this is supplementary, and I think that and the, the beauty of it is that it can really be integrated through a range of data collections. So you can really include it if you are doing um, nutrition surveillance data, if you are doing uh, any food security related uh, uh, surveys also, uh, because as, as um, the partners have mentioned, it actually takes a very small amount of time to ask them to go Yannick, your uh, sound is going out. I don't know, it might be the connection. Apologies, I think I do have some connection issues here. It's, it's, uh, I'm calling from home, it's a bit late here, so apologies. But indeed, uh, it is complementary and what is this referring to? Um, Of, of different uh, surveys or 
Thank you so much. And um, yeah, if you also want to type maybe something in the chat, um, just for clarity because of the audio, feel free to do that. So then uh, there's a, a common question too that has come up um, about whether there are plans to collect other data by Gallup or, or in general. So would, um, maybe Anna, can you start answering that and then we'll pass it to Andy? Sure, I can start. Yeah, so um, as you can see on the website, um, you can see exactly which countries are planned for data collection this year and next year. It's another about 38 countries or so um, in addition to what we have now. You'll see that uh, there are gaps. Um, there are uh, essentially no countries in Europe that are covered, uh, Middle Eastern countries, Pacific, Caribbean, and other parts of Latin America. And the reason for that is really um, funding driven. You know, these collection of these data rely on donor funding, and many of our donors uh, have restrictions on spending uh, their resources on geographic areas or really on um, to on uh, countries that are high income. So uh, we do believe that it is important to have data across all countries and that diet quality is a public health issue everywhere. Um, you know, the, the Global Burden of Disease study estimates that uh, poor diets are essentially the top risk factor in the global burden of disease. And a lot of that has to do with uh, non-communicable disease risk. And that's very important in high income countries and not only in low and middle income countries. Um, so I think, you know, what we've done so far is, is we're building towards global data collection. There needs to be uh, more of a sustained effort for diet data monitoring across countries. And some of this will probably come from countries themselves. You know, we would like to provide these tools so that countries can implement the DQQ in uh, very easily in their existing monitoring systems. It's a five minute module that can be inserted into a um, household consumption and expenditure survey. For example, um, I think Janneke was referring to that possibility of how the, how the questionnaire can be incorporated into existing um, questionnaires and data collection within a country. And I, I wondered if Andy might like to reflect a little bit on how that's happened in Gallup's experience in the past uh, regarding food insecurity. Absolutely. So um, I suppose the forefront, forerunner for this project was Gallup's collaboration with the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization um, on validation and implementation of the food insecurity experience scale. Um, so essentially we helped partner with FAO to validate what would be the framework which would eventually become the food insecurity experience scale. And then in 2014, did the first global implementation of the fire scale in 144 countries. Um, because of that experience, obviously, um, obviously we provide the tools, the data, which acted as a catalyst for greater literacy in terms of the food insecurity experience scale. Um, so due to essentially uh, extended efforts by the um, ESS team at FAO, um, we've now seen a huge level of adoption of the food insecurity experience scale within national governments themselves. Um, obviously, part of that's been driven from its adoption as an SDG um, indicator, but also just by the fact that there's broad recognition of the utility of it uh, as a general purpose mechanism for measuring food insecurity. So obviously, the parallels between that work and this uh, are, are bountiful. And so hopefully we can see a similar level of success around this initiative as we've seen for that one. Thank you, Andy. So I see that, um, oh, Gina, did you want to also comment or should we move to the next question? I think let's just go ahead and take another question from the audience. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I will, um, I think we could probably take two more questions. So I will ask, um, both uh, people who have their hand raised to uh, answer, I mean, to ask the question so we can answer both. Um, I will ask Abdulaziz Muhammadiko, if you can please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon or greeting of the day. Uh, my name is Muhammadiko Abdulaziz. I'm calling from Nigeria. Uh, 
thank you for this uh, wonderful and a very interesting presentation. My question is, I always see nutrition activities, most especially around the developed countries, but little you can see around Africa, more especially in the West Africa, where you know we have actually serious nutritional issues. I know our various government in the West Africa, particularly in Nigeria, are trying their best. But what are really the contributions for one, the professional, like you people that are actually doing this wonderful presentation, two, for the nutrition society, that more especially in the one in the UK, what are the efforts? Because I'm actually a trained nutritionist uh, from Brooks University, but I have been trying to put, I mean, lay my hand on any place that uh, I can say I'm seeing my profession, I can practice my profession properly. I'm always just hanging around, seeing little or no, no nothing around us. So please, how can I really feel the impact? More especially, you have presented a very wonderful paper today, but of what significant, of what use will it be to me now here that I'm in Nigeria? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So before we answer, I also want uh, to ask Nancy Adero to uh, ask her question. Sorry, I think I muted you by, by error. Can you unmute? Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for the great presentations. I joined in a bit late, but um, I did capture a lot. So my apologies in case I ask anything that has been answered already. Um, one is, um, does the tool take into account the different methodologies that are used by uh, the different surveys. We know UDHS uses some other methodologies in testing for anemia, in anemia. Uh, in Uganda, um, we do have the UNPS and we do use different methodologies as well. Um, and how often do you have to update uh, this data based on the different sources of data that we countries could possibly be having? And like uh, one of the presenters said, others are, you know, three, the UDHS is every five years. So what do you choose? Is there a standard, a gold standard for which methodologies and results are used? Then lastly, um, um, does the tool, and I will explore more, sorry, I haven't been acquainted to it uh, quite much, but does it have a dashboard to sort of uh, provide some basic interpretation uh, of the that data that we are seeing and how it influences uh, on the on a lot of the, the 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 outcome indicators? I think I saw an NCD score, so I don't know whether some have as well. Um, Relatedly, uh, I wanted to ask whether you do, whether the tool can measure the contributions of the different interventions in countries um, in, uh, in uh, improving the diet quality. Thank you and over. Thank you. So uh, we'll take time to uh, answer the last two questions and feel free to also give any last thoughts. Yeah, let me jump in first and then I'll pass it over to um, the other panel members just to close out. But thank you so much, Mohammed and Nancy for those really great questions, appreciate them. What I'd like to say, um, yes, Mohammed, I know sometimes, sometimes we struggle, right, as a nutrition community to really feel like we're making an impact. Um, but nevertheless, I, I'm kind of a glass half full person myself and I do feel like we are making impact. So why would I feel that way? I mean, more than a decade ago, I was working at Food and Agriculture Organization to really um, work on food-based indicators to understand agriculture systems and actual, actual food that people eat, right? And so we developed the minimum dietary diversity for women. And now we can fast forward a decade. That really is that indicator is being used. I, we heard uh, earlier today from a colleague that uh, it's been adopted, I think, in the CADAP framework for Africa. So it's something that takes a while to catch on, but indeed, if we're patient, these, these things do catch on. And that's just you know in the realm of indicators. 
There's many other indicators that we have seen improvement. But I, I think um, for the Global Diet Quality Project, we're taking quite a leap forward in, in several important avenues for us as nutritionists, right? One is the nutrition transition. You can go anywhere in the world, even a very remote village, and I bet, guarantee you can find a Coca-Cola to purchase. Now, I'm not saying that everybody purchases them. I'm not saying that everybody has the economic means to do so, but it's there and it's available. And we don't know anything about how people are consuming that. So this is a leap forward in helping us to understand those dietary risk factors that we as nutritionists would see everywhere, marketed on billboards, sold in our supermarkets, given to our children, right? So, so we, are making, we are making progress in saying, these are really important for us as public health nutritionists to get our mind around measuring, right? Once you measure it, then it goes into policy, then it goes into advocacy. Then we say, hey, look, Minister of Health, this is the population is consuming these foods that WHO recommends they do not consume, all these ultra processed foods, or we have very low consumption of fruits and vegetables. So um, I don't wanna take up too much space, but also to answer Nancy's question about dashboards, um, a lot of the indicators that are measured through the diet quality questionnaire are available on the food systems dashboard. And uh, that has you know, direct links to policy and advocacy. There are a lot of uh, peer review publications that are coming out from another group on food systems. So the Food Systems Countdown Initiative is another initiative that's taking on board this concept of uh, understanding diet quality, using it, advocating uh, with policymakers and at country level uh, to sort of you know, get our minds around the public health nutrition crisis that we, we, we experience every day in our own countries is happening. So uh, just don't lose hope. Just keep up, keep up the good work and keep interacting with your networks and your societies. And, and I, I do think that you will find some change happening. Thank you, Gina. Any last thoughts uh, from our panelists? Well, we have gone over time. So I think I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for the speakers. And we, um, I also, I, I am also part of the DTQ adaptation team. So I know that a lot of our key informants are here. So we want to thank you again for all your collaboration because we could not have done this without you. And I'm really proud of um, this global effort to make these tools available um, for everyone who could use them. So thank you so much. And I will close uh, the webinar. Uh, you'll have a good day and evening uh, in all the places where you, where you are. <laughs>